Hey, Brad, you have a nifty photo uh, taking your place. Well, I just have my name. Robert, you yeah. see my mic on. <laughs> oh, Hi, sorry. everyone. Welcome. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> just don't start, you know, trash talking each other. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you are drinking something along with the uh, event tonight, let us know what you're drinking. And if you use the drop down and say all panelists and attendees, then it'll be everyone who's attending um, can see where you're tuning in from. I'm in Seattle, Brad and Robert are in New York. Toronto, Seattle, Oxnard. Hello. Not drinking yet. <laughs> I know on the West Coast, it's only five o'clock. It feels a little indulgent, doesn't it? Though I guess in uh, COVID times, every time, every hour is cocktail hour, huh? Boston, hello. Upstate New York, hello. Bloomington, Indiana. Oh, hi. I went to Butler. Barnegat. Oh, you're drinking Barty. I'm like, where is Barty Get Light? <laughs> hello, Westside LA, Chicago. Hello, hello. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get, oh, La Paz, Mexico. Hello, Anchorage. Mezcaletti, that sounds fantastic. And Agroni in Queens. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us this evening or this afternoon or maybe this morning, depending on where you are. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. And in uh, sort of more traditional times, I guess we'll say, I host a lot of author talks and cooking classes in the kitchen in our store. And for the past year or so, we have taken those online to Zoom. The great thing about that is that we can have conversations like the one tonight where we have a couple of authors in New York joining us. And as you can see from the chat, people from all over the country and the world joining us as well. So thank you so much everyone for being here. I'm delighted to welcome Robert Simonson. He is an, a writer and obviously the author of the brand new book, Mezcal and Tequila Cocktails. He's going to be in conversation with his good friend, Brad Thomas Parsons, also a longtime friend of Book Larder. And they are going to make cocktails, talk about cocktails, and of course, leave time for your questions. If you wouldn't mind, if you could use the chat to talk to each other, but use the Q&A button to ask questions, that'll be a little bit easier for Brad and Robert to keep track of. The book is available at booklarder.com and I will drop a link into the chat as well so that um, you can, if you're ordering the book, support this talk by ordering, ordering it from Booklarder or any independent bookstore. Um, you know, that's all good. And a lot of you have already. So thank you so much for doing that. All right. So enough of me. Let's welcome Brad Thomas Parsons and Robert Simonson. Hey, Robert. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Robert. Can't hear you. Got it. Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. All right. All right. I hope everyone can hear us. Um, uh, welcome and thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Brad Thomas Parsons. Um, I used to live in Seattle for 11 years and and uh, miss it often and, and, and can't wait to come back to see everybody. I'm in Brooklyn now. Um, and uh, a, a quick little, I'm an author. Uh, I write about drinks, bars, bars cult, bar culture, spirits, and um, I've written Bitters, Amaro, Distillery Cats, and Last Call. And uh, Robert, I'm happy to say, is a, is a good friend of mine. And uh, especially during this past year, he and his wife, uh, Mary Kate, and I have, uh, you know, did the tiptoe safely distanced meetups and throughout the time. and. And it's really kept our spirit, my spirit up, I know, having getting to talk with them. And just a quick little anecdote, you know, when I first moved, I, I started my book Bitters in Seattle and I finished it in New York. And so moving back to New York, um, a lot of people were like, well, who's this guy writing about bitters? Like no one knew about me. And I knew about Robert and it turned out I'd see him in my neighborhood a lot in Brooklyn. And and we eventually started talking and, and I was always a little intimidated by him, you know, he's, he, uh, 
he has a great reputation in the spirits world. And I knew we were close neighbors. And then one of those days where it was the first snow, he posts on Instagram, like first snow. And he was shooting <laughs> from his back window and it was my fire escape. So we were literally back to back oh. neighbors. Um, we've yeah. both since moved, but uh, um, we are in different places, but we're still very close and get to see each other. So we're gonna have a nice time. His new book is terrific. Uh, I've had the chance to read it cover to cover and I posted put posted notes on so many recipes and I can't wait for him to tell you more about that. And uh, as one, as we do, when you come into our home, virtual or real, we're gonna start off with a, a quick drink. So I'm gonna make a drink from Robert's book um, that is of course about Amaro focused. And um, it is a drink called The Last Mechanical Art. And Robert, let me know if I'm mixing up the name, but it's Max uh, Pozniak or from- uh, uh, Max, Max Pozuniak. That's a, so, yeah, it's a so tough. He, one. Yeah, so he and Kirk Estepona um, were two uh, bartenders from Cure in New Orleans, and they wrote these two very groundbreaking um, self-published books called Rogue Cocktails and Beta Cocktails. They're long out of print and very expensive now, but they were known for just taking these, especially bitters, Amari, helping lead the charge for that and mixing them up in, in kind of unexpected ways. So, so what I'm making tonight is, sounds like a Negroni, but it's got these, you'll see there's fairly distinctive, strong ingredients that will hopefully all meld together here. So I'm gonna give a little tilt down to the workstation. And I am using, um, it calls for a different expression of Del Maguey, but I have the Vita, like so many do. Um, mm -hmm. This is one of the more popular ones, but I think it's, is it the, how do you say Robert Chichipa? Ch or, uh, Chichicapa. Ch Chichi Ka, yeah. calls for the Chibi Kapka. Kapka the Vita will work. Vita. It'll work. Yeah. So this is three quarters ingredients, equal parts. So we start with three quarters mezcal. And then we'll get into some more ingredients I'm more familiar with. And, uh, you know, Campari, uh, the famous uh, Milanese bitter, very distinctive, uh, aggressively bitter in a fun way, some citrus notes, herbaceous. Uh, you can use other red bitters. There are a lot out there now, but we're sticking with the original ones it called for. So three quarters Campari. And then for another favorite Amaro of mine is Chinar, the one with the artichoke on the label. Uh, of the 13 ingredients, artichoke leaf is the only known one. So this has a sort of savory, slightly vegetal taste, low ABV. Uh, it's like six, 16%, 16.5, and it is uh, has a strong note of bitterness cap on the floor. And then for the vermouth, we're going with Punta Mes, which is a lovely, lovely vermouth. You can drink this on its own on the rocks with an orange peel. It is a, a Piemontes vermouth that, the, as the name implies, point and a half. It's one part uh, of vermouth and a half part bitter. So it's got some additional bitterness to it. So we put those all in a mixing glass and add our ice. Have you ever had this drink before, Brad? I haven't. No, I, I definitely, when I was writing Bitters uh, and Amaro, you know, I referenced their books a lot, uh -huh. um, but I, I've never made this one. Oh, I'm looking forward the, to... Oh, this be interesting. See how, what do you think of it? Pretty intense. Yeah. All right. And then I took, it lost a little bit of the chill, but you definitely, you know, you want to put your, your coop, this is a Nick and Nora in this case, in the uh, freezer for at least 10, 15 minutes before you're going to use it. And we want to stir to dilute and chill for a little bit. All right, and then. Yes, right, here we go. Bob Easterly points out, this is page 45 in the book, in case anyone out there wants to make this drink and has the ingredients right now. Our friend Ed Anderson, who is the photographer of all of my books, who's actually in New York I got to meet, on a I shoot. Got to meet Ed last night. Um, he is, uh, he's drinking a Negroni, and I think he's going to have some Popeye's fried chicken. He said he's going to order it. So this is <laughs> the last mechanical art. Thank all right, you drink Robert. And now Robert, why don't you make us a drink, and then we'll get into the the business. Okay, I'm going to make a drink too. Um, I have decided to make a. Uh, Polar bear. There is there's the name and there's a photo. As you can see, it's nice. clear. Uh, the polar bear was invented um, 
at a bar called Trick Dog in San Francisco in 2013, which was the year that they opened. It's a very famous bar and uh, they've won many awards, uh, one of the better known cocktail bars in the country. And um, I'm, gonna ma I'm making this one because it was actually one of the first mezcal cocktails I had that made a very deep impression on, impression on me. When I first went to Trick Dog for the first time in San Francisco, it's what I ordered first. Um, and I ordered it because it seemed um, so strange and unusual because the ingredients, I mean, it was mezcal. They use mezcal union. This is a mm -hmm. brand, which is actually an ensemble of uh, two different agaves. Um, and they use um, not dry vermouth or sweet vermouth, but blanc vermouth, which lands somewhere in the middle. And, uh, and this is what intrigued me. They, they put creme de menthe in. And I thought, who's putting creme de menthe with mezcal? That sounds crazy. I mean, how could that possibly taste good? Um, also, they uh, had a small tincture made from angelica root. Oh, wow. Um, I did not make the tincture. I talked to the people at Trick Dog who made this uh, drink. And I said, well, if I put this drink in the book, I don't think people are going to make angelica tincture or they're going to not even be able to find angelica root. Mm -hmm. So what's a good substitute? And they said, well, if you have to, uh, celery bitters. So six dashes of celery bitters. I already mixed it up to save time. It's here in my nice. cocktail pitcher. So I'm just going to put some ice in there, stir it up, and drink it. Um, and uh, it doesn't have any garnish. I assume they call it the polar bear because it's clear and it looks kind of icy and cool. Um, yeah, so back then, uh, Mezcal was just starting to uh, you know, gain in stature in the United States and uh, more cocktail bars were beginning to serve cocktails with tequila and Mezcal. That had not been the case, you know, even five years earlier. Um, but now, as we know, almost yeah. every bar you go into, has a tequila drink, a mezcal drink, perhaps several on the menu. And there, there are months. Uh oh. That was a coast. Okay, um, it wasn't vintage. Uh, Nothing vintage broke, right? No. Old metal coasters with ducks on them that used to belong to my grandmother. Uh. Nothing can kill them. <laughs> uh, okay, so, Brad, I got my so polar bear there. with your last mechanical yeah. art. Cheers. <laughs> And whoever, whoever else is out there, here's to yeah. you. Thanks if anyone for joining else diving. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs> All right. Okay, just kidding. All right. Um, here we go. So, Robert, you and I are both, all of our, our work, our libraries have been with uh, 10 Speed Press, um, mm -hmm. wonderful publisher based out of uh, uh, Emeryville near San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. What, so this is your fifth book. So um, what was your, your your eureka moment to bring this particular form of an idea into a book proposal? Or was it a full-on book proposal? Or, or was it like, yeah, let's do it kind of back of an envelope? Your um, yeah, it was uh, kind of like that. It happened very quickly. I was actually... Um, uh, it, the, what, what inspired me was what's always inspired me with cocktail books. You look around you, you see what's happening in bars, what bartenders are getting excited about, what drinkers are being excited about. And I just noticed that uh, tequila and mezcal were on the rise. They were no longer uh, spirits that you just drank as a shot or perhaps in a margarita. Um, mm -hmm. They were being used uh, the same way that all other spirits were being used. And this was all thanks to uh, cocktail bartenders and, and the cocktail revival. And I thought, well, there's not really a book out there that tells you, there were books out there that told you the history of agave spirits, um, but not ones that just said, um, here's how you mix with them. And so I thought maybe something simple like that was needed on the market. And I pitched it to them and I think they accepted it the same day. Of course, I wrote a proposal afterwards. That's great. Yeah, that happens sometimes, rarely, rarely. Yeah. You, never, you never know. Well, well, I know too, we also share a literary agent um, David Black, shout out to David Black. And uh, I know I've had that where our publisher, Aaron Wenner would say, just just put it in a paragraph. And and David would insist on a proposal. He's like, no, because it, you know, proposal could definitely help you form that outline in advance and, and put that clear idea. But, but uh, 
it's yeah. So I, I, it's, yeah, I've, I've I've always, you know, whether it's early on or after the fact, I've always written the proposal. You have to write the proposal. Yeah. That's just gotcha. part, of, but, part of the process. Um, and I, I kind of painted myself in a corner with my style of book with Amaro and Last Call, where Ed Anderson, my photographer, and I, a lot of it is uh, there's a big travelogue element where we're visiting these bars and, and, and producers. And so with COVID, obviously, my next book was on is on dive bars, and we've had to postpone that another year out. Um, but when we met one of the first times together during pandemic, I was kind of surprised that you'd already, the book was pretty wrapped up. But, yeah. um, but, but as we went to lockdown, I know you did your photo shoot with uh, Lizzie Monroe, who did all the great pho photography and is the art director at Punch, um, where we also both write. So what was the, what was the photo shoot like during, during COVID? Yeah, and where was, did you shoot it? It was unlike any other photo shoot that I've experienced, I'm sure, <laughs> unlike any that Lizzie uh, has experienced, and sh she's been a photographer for many years now. Um, yeah, the book was already written. I had turned it in. So that was done when uh, the pandemic hit. But now we had to shoot the photos. And, you know, usually you um, you ask permissions of bars and you go there and you do it in the interior. You've got all kinds of uh, all kinds of um, access. But now you had to worry because, you know, you didn't want to get anyone sick. Um, so we chose uh, two bars primarily that we knew and trusted. We knew the people there. So we had a good work working relationship already. And they knew that we'd be safe. And we knew that they'd be safe. And we also knew that the bartenders there knew how to style drinks. So the two were Donna, which was in Williamsburg, and Diamond Reef, which is in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And sadly, they both uh, closed. Yeah. Um, Diamond, Diamond Reef just November, week, they, yeah. It did not survive the pandemic. Diamond Reef was a different story. Uh, the landlord sold the building and they may reopen. But yeah. uh, because of that too, I mean, all the photos in here are now historical documents of those wonderful bars. No, I, I mean, uh, not, see, I felt the same way with Last Call where, you know, of the 40 plus profiles, five of those bars at least are permanently closed and, and it's taken on a time, it's a time capsule like quality yeah. and an added layer of poignancy, but uh, for sure. And, and now I know we likely don't have an all industry crowd tonight, though I know you have a lot of folks on. Would you mind just breaking down that essential definition of what makes a tequila, tequila, and a mezcal, a mezcal, and sure. how they align and, and differ from each other in ingredients and uh, production? So tequila and mezcal are both made in Mexico. They are both made uh, from the distillation of the agave plant. Um, which is a large uh, spiky plant that grows low to the ground. Um, it uh, looks like a cactus, but it's more associated to the, like the asparagus family, actually. Um, tequila, so the way it works is think about whiskey. Um, all bourbon is whiskey, but all whiskey is not bourbon. So all tequila is mezcal, but not all mezcals are tequila. Mezcal is the ancestral spirit. It is the heritage spirit that's been made for hundreds of years. Tequila is a, a more relatively recent phenomenon. Tequila can only be made with one agave plant, the blue agave, and it's primarily made in the state of Jalisco. Mezcal can be made with uh, 30 or more different agave plants. You can choose whatever agave plant you want and it's still mezcal and it can be made in nine different states. Although quite frankly, it's made all over Mexico, even in states that are not you know, legally calling it mezcal. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of interesting because obviously more people know about tequila than mezcal. But mezcal, if I may say so, is the more historical and important spirit. Tequila is just one of them. But but both have to be made in Mexico, or or can you make them outside of Mexico? No, they must be made in Mexico. They must be made in Mexico. Okay. Yeah, and there I are. A big, yeah. I know a big misconception of mezcal is that it's all of them are smoky. You always hear like, oh, I don't like it, it's smoky, or oh, I love it, it's smoky. But mm -hmm. is that the biggest mis misconception? And there are different kind of just like, uh, you know, other spirits, or there are different uh, personalities to different producers yeah. right that come through that, that maybe not smoky but more vegetal or or yes. different other flavor notes yes that's right um because mezcal was uh, dimly understood outside of mexico 
um, when people started to teach people here and in other countries what mezcal was, they came up with, you know, quick and easy kind of thumbnail uh, descriptions of what it was like, how do you, how do we, how do we describe this spirit, you know, to the public? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are smoky because like when you, um, when you harvest the agave plants and you, the, the center of the plant is called the piña, it kind of looks like a pineapple. And uh, then you cook and roast them in an earthen pit over a number of days. And this gives a smoky flavor to many of them. But it's wrong to think that they're all smoky because like you said, some taste some vegetal, some to have a kind of a, a salty, a saline taste. You can taste uh, tropical fruits in there. It's, it's the closest that any spirit comes to wine in adopting its surroundings, not just the soil, mm -hmm but the air, whether it's in the highlands up in the mountains or whether it's down in the valley, it all makes a very big difference. Well, I think too, like, um, not to kick it back to my favorite category, Amaro, but there are a lot of similarities in, um, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, there's a sense of terroir to a lot of, originally with a lot of Amaro, Amari, where, where they were made. So whether it's Southern style, Alpine style, uh, Northern style Amaro, um, the ingredients used, the production methods, but but that each bottle is such a distinct, singular experience, even within the same kind of categories, like like yeah. trying five different Fernet side mm -hmm. by side. But a big thing too is, um, it went from you know how away from how it was supposed to be consumed, you know, as a digestivo, to this darling cocktail ingredient. So it went from dusty digestivo to modern cocktail ingredient, and. Um, Similar thing with mezcal and tequila. Um, uh, you know, like bartenders have definitely led the charge, and and producers in making yes. us aware of this this these spirits. Um, I like too in the book how you mentioned. Um, I remember. I guess for me, it felt like it was the '90s, like the single malt craze. Yeah, it was um, the '90s. Like, yeah. yeah, like in swingers, you know, ordering the 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 single malts at the at the casino. Um, but you said too that the obsession over that was all because you know, good scotch was always, you were never supposed to do anything to it, to bastardize it. It was just served neat in a glass and it never made that jump um, into cocktails. Is, is there anything else you want to say on that? Or is that just a, that was just a uh, fun fact I love. Well, I, as I was doing research and as I, um, as I was putting the book together, um, I did see parallels to um, the craze for single malt uh, scotch in the 90s because um, like mezcal, people didn't really understand single malt scotch back then. Uh, it was drunk mainly in Scotland, and it didn't really leave. We here in the United States, we drank blended scotch. Um, but then people became to understand it. And, and they sort of got this idea that it was um, a more authentic scotch, you know, a more artisanal scotch, and it was made in smaller batches. Uh, it was more expensive. It seemed authentic. Um, and there are some parallels to mezcal that way, too. I think... Uh, Agave fans who really love mezcal, they do think of it as this authentic artisanal spirit. Uh, but the difference is that I point out in the book and that you mentioned that because mezcal has come to the fore during the cocktail revival, it's gotten this new life within cocktails. Single malt mm -hmm. scotch never got a life within cocktails and it still doesn't have a life within cocktails. Yeah, so it's really benefited um, most people in Mexico and other elsewhere do drink mezcal and tequila by itself. They sip it. And, and mm -hmm. that's a wonderful way to experience it. But we have also found, you know, that you can mix it. And that's really, that's, that's the, the new thing about mezcal and tequila in the last 10 years, that suddenly they are recognized as fantastic cocktail spirits. Absolutely. And I know like you talked in the book too about, um, you know, tequila, had a bad rap because of mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the uh, the qual bad quality of tequila being used, and it's one of yeah. those spirits like gin. Gin for some people too, when they have that bad experience, is a yeah. Is it it always with gin or tequila? It's gin you know, or tequila it's one that they got drunk on when they were seventeen yeah. years old, and they'll never drink it again. <laughs> yeah, for me it was tequila for sure. In my uh, mm -hmm. shout out to Suni Oswego uh, uh, days, um, uh, and some early after that, when you opened a cap be like ooh, you like you get these flashbacks it, to yeah. to bad nights and and bad bad uh decisions um but i uh, think i think that happened a lot with tequila because 
People were taught to drink tequila as shots and nothing else. So you just knock back a few shots. Of course, you feel bad in the morning. Nobody was saying, you know, let's knock back some shots of brandy. You know, <laughs> it was always tequila. So tequila got a reputation as a bad boy spirit, you know, yeah. that with bad memories. Indeed. But like you said, you know, now like the quality brands and producers out there where it can be, you can have a flight or a copito, but it's really about the cocktails. Um, and I was wondering, can you speak to the arc of, it sounds like it's more mezcal than tequila, but the, the, the fairly recent ascent of the popularity and the quality and who were some of the key players, whether producers, bars or bartenders that set the stage sure. to where we are now? Yeah, there were a few early champions um, in uh, the United States. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Julio Bermejo, whose family owned a Mexican restaurant in San Francisco called Tommy's Mexican Restaurant. And he was put in charge of the bar. And so he decided he was going to make something of it. So he started studying tequila. He started carrying only 100% agave tequila, because there is this type of tequila called mixto, which is only 51% agave and the rest can be anything. It could be jet fuel. You have no idea. And so he decided he'd only, he'd only carry quality tequila and he put quality tequila in his margaritas. And then he started, he developed a tequila club that you could join. If you drank ever, however, so many uh, tequilas, you got little, little checks on your punch card. He started taking uh, patrons down to Mexico to teach them about tequila. He started, uh, and then the bartenders started coming there and learning about it. So he helped change the reputation. So he's Great one guy. guy. There's another guy named David Soro. He's in Philadelphia. Um, he was born in Guadalajara, but then he came north and he took over a restaurant in Philadelphia and he actually named it Tequila or tequilas. And this was in, oh, like 1990. And back then that was a dangerous thing to call your restaurant because if you call it tequilas, people are gonna think you have a rowdy joint, you know? And, but he called it that because he respected tequila and the heritage and the history, and he wanted other people to respect it. And he did the same thing. He kept taking people to Mexico to meet the people who made these spirits. And uh, he made quality drinks. He had all the best tequilas behind his bar. Um, there, there are quite a few players. Uh, there's a guy named Ron Cooper, who was a painter in New Mexico. He went to Mexico and he painted there for a while and he became enamored of Mezcal and he started meeting all the Mezcalaros, which is the name of the people who make the Mezcal. And, um, that's the job. And he, it became his passion project to bring these Mezcals to the United States and have people understand what a beautiful spirit this was. And then there was a bartender that you and I know called Phil Ward. Um, he used to work at a bar called Death and Company. And one day he started, he started mixing with tequila and mezcal just to see what would happen. And he realized that uh, they mixed very well. He created a famous uh, modern classic cocktail called the Owaka Old Fashioned, which has tequila and mezcal in it. And then he went and he opened his own bar called Maya Well, which was one of the first agave focused bars in the United States, it opened in 2009. So, I mean, you know, bit by bit, year by year, evangelist by evangelist, you know, the reputation of these spirits uh, grew and people became more uh, enlightened as to their qualities. It, it seems that the bartender, uh, either press trip or, or organized trip to Oaxaca and different producers, is a rite of passage where they just become consumed with it after when they really see mm -hmm. how how uh, laborious the process is and and meet the families in many cases of the producers and and see, see that like they really uh, become evangelized when they come back. Yes, that. yes. Um, Particularly with mezcal, these are often um, uh, family enterprises, generation mm -hmm. after generation, making a particular recipe for mezcal. And yes, if you've ever been lucky enough to go down there and see. Uh, mezcal be made you you are instantly impressed you know it, it's just so um I, 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 I it's just so sincere every step of it you know it's just like mm -hmm. there's it's it's not automated it's not corporate it's just a kind of a a, a beautiful uh, age-old process right and 
you know, one topic with this category, you know, it, it's not just limited to mezcal and tequila, but celebrities want a piece of the action now. Yes. And, you know, we've had like Matthew McConaughey with Wild Turkey and Ryan Reynolds with Aviation Gin, but mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of, act you know, George Clooney and Randy Gerber famously uh, yeah. sold uh, Casamigos for a crazy amount of money, like, like a, it was a billion or, or a billion, it was a billion dollars or more. A yeah. And, and we have Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul with uh, Zobala. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Carlos Santana with Casa Noble and Kendall Jenner, of course, with 818. Um, what is it about tequila and mezcal in particular that, that's an attractive fit for a celebrity collaboration? And what are your thoughts on such partnerships? Hmm. Is, it, is it good for the awareness or is it, does it undermine it? Hmm. Not to be negative, I'm it's just curious. It's a good thinking. question. It's very complicated. Um, I, I don't want to pretend to know the motivations of these people, but if I was to, were to guess, I mean, George Clooney was the first to really do this uh, successfully. And I think every, when he sold that company after five years for that amount of money, I mean, he sold it for more money than he made on all of his movies, you know, combined. Um, I think people paid attention and they thought, okay, well, let's follow that model. I, I'm not, maybe they all love tequila, these celebrities. I do not know. Mm -hmm. but I'm guessing they just following in the footsteps of Clooney. And there are quite a few of them. Obviously it makes uh, tequila more glamorous, I suppose. Um, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's troubling. There are issues of appropriation and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I uh, live well, on the second floor, so when, on a busy, busy Atlantic Avenue, and when trucks go by, they're often at eye level, and I see so many branded, I see, I see the Clooney go by all the time on a Casamigos tr truck, and the celebrities go by, so it, it gets kind of comical, but I mean, following Clooney's footsteps can't be a bad move, I guess, but, uh, but, um, but they all, no one's going to probably have that success he did, they did, you know, but who knows, but uh well, oh, yeah, supposedly it's, it's, the um, tequila put out by uh, The Rock, uh, Dwayne Johnson, is yes. is now the, the best-selling tequila in the United States, I have heard. So, Wow. Yeah, I when, I was, when I was researching this, he was number one on the top 10 celebrity, celebrity-owned brands. But uh, the yeah. Clooney one was the first one that kind of caught my eye. But I think it was Sammy Hagar goes back with tequila, too. I think it was the Cabo Sammy, Wabo. Yeah, or... Sammy Hagar was kind of a pioneer in that area. Yeah, he was early. Yeah, the Cabo Wabo, Wabo, you know, he was the... And he did very well. He sold that for a yeah. lot of money. Not a billion dollars, yeah. but a lot of money. No. All right. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned, uh, is, is sustainability still a concern with mezcal tequila? And, you know, is there enough agave to keep producing the in the traditional methods of what consumers mm. are desiring? Um, any, anything you want to, any yes, thoughts um, on sustainability? It's, it's, of course, you know, a, a concern and it will remain a concern. One of the things that's troubling about, um, you know, it's wonderful that these spirits are being recognized, you know, as being as good as any spirit in the world. But the kind of land rush that has followed is uh, troubling because it's, it's not like other crops. Agave plants um, take from seven to 30 years to grow to maturity. So, I mean, you just have to do the math and you realize, you know, you can't be harvesting them hand over fist and expect there to be more agave plants in the future. We're going to run out. Um, so hopefully people are going to be taking uh, steps to make sure that doesn't happen. But right now, I mean, who can, I don't know. There are a lot of corporations going down to Mexico right now and, uh, I don't, I don't know if they have like the future of the environment first and foremost in their minds. Um, so it, it, it's like, I wrote an article about this for the New York Times a few years ago. It's like all the, uh, all the people who love agave, all the bartenders who love mezcal up here, it's like, please appreciate the spirit, but don't drink too much of it. <laughs> Moderation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, definitely, I'd say like you say, I... I'm not, I was never really drawn to, to mezcal as a go-to, but it winds up in so many cocktails, you know, like you said, these mm -hmm. days and a lot, and, and it does play very well with Amaro, you know, the mezcal Negroni um, is, is a really wonderful drink. I don't order it a lot, but that was, I know our friend Brian Bartles 
back in Madison, Wisconsin. That's one of his favorites. And uh, Mezcal Negroni um, is very popular. Mezcal margaritas are ridiculously popular. Yeah, we we had those the other night. Yeah, from Phil. Yes, we did, um, yeah. And in the book, I love that you know this isn't as you said, it's not a, a deep deep dive on history and your favorite brands but it's all about the drinks and and what you can do with these and i loved um i'm going to talk about some of the drinks in a minute with you but i loved in the back of the book i don't know if you folks can see this little flow chart sort of thing where if you like and it, and it goes on for a couple of spreads so it's like you know if you if your drink is a mai tai you know try the tea, the tea uh, mia or if your drink is a manhattan try the mezcal cocktail right. um, was that something you knew you wanted in the book or did it yeah, come out no. after like we have all these drinks. Let's let's do something fun with it. I knew that. Uh, so it's interesting. The mezcal came to cocktails. Mezcal and tequila came to cocktails rather late, and so to a certain extent, when bartenders began playing around with it, they used already existing models. You know, for the margarita and the Negroni and the Martini and the Manhattan and the daiquiri and whatever. Um, and so uh, it's also a very adaptable spirit, a uh, surprisingly adaptable. Uh, I say in the book that I think it's, it's perhaps more mix, as mixable as gin, you know, because it wow. really, it really goes with everything surprisingly because um, it's, it's, it's a very strong and forthright spirit, uh, smoky, spicy, vegetal, uh, all those things. And you would think that it wouldn't get along with so many things, but it actually does. And so um, it gets along with pear brandy and sherry and uh, creme de menthe and creme de cacao. It's, it's quite astounding. Um, so I know that people go into bars and they look at the menu and they say, this drink looks good to me. Could you make it with mezcal instead? And mm -hmm. then the bartender says, fine, and often it works. So that's why I have the guide in the back. You know, like if you're a, a Manhattan person, here are some mezcal variations and tequila variations on those on the Manhattan. Very nice. Um, as I mentioned, I I posted several drinks in this book. Um, I want to make soon the Benny Blanco, Augie March, yep. Mezcalero, the real deal with Fernet uh, Branca in there. Um, do you have a, a couple of drinks for either from the mezcal and tequila section that you would particularly encourage uh, readers or our guests tonight to try this weekend, e either because they're amazing and popular, or maybe because they're unexpected and or, and and a unexpected hmm. serve, maybe. Not well, to put you on the spot. But. First, I'd like to say that if you are unfamiliar with tequila and mezcal and you don't drink it very often in cocktails, um, start uh, simply have um, a mezcal Negroni, have a mezcal margarita have some of the simpler ones um, and see how you like it. Um, as far as surprising ones, well, there are quite a few. There's one uh, that was invented at a bar in New Orleans called Latitude 29 that we know. It's a tiki bar mm -hmm. down there. It's called Sean and Juan. And uh, it actually, here, let me find it. It's in the tequila section. Take there it is. And um, I was I, I had this at the bar because again I was surprised by the ingredients. It had tequila and uh, Jameson Irish whiskey and creme de cacao and Benedictine, and I was just thinking this is a little crazy. Um, so I tried it, but it was fantastic. Um, so you need a lot of ingredients for that one, but you might want to try that. Uh, the polar bear that I just made is very simple to make. Um, mm -hmm. That I think that will surprise a lot of people as to how mezcal can work in a drink. Um, there are a few from those books you mentioned, the Rogue Cocktails and Beta Cocktails um, that use a lot of uh, Amaros, strong Amaros. Um, yeah, I, look, I looked in the index. There's a, yeah, you have Fernet, Maletti, Montenegro, Nonino. There's a lot of Amari used. Yeah, in these. yeah, there are. Nice. And, and that's the way it ended up being. Um, what, can you there's a drink. What? Oh, good. No, no go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. That's a, there's okay, a few he, things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you. <laughs> oh okay. no no you go all right so <laughs> I, I, i'm blanking on the name right now but it's in the it's been in the because your book is out and you just wrote about it katie stipe's drink um oh, with, with siesta. This, siesta can you tell us about that that sounds amazing and and i've never ordered one i know it's available at land off menu but um tell us a little bit about the siesta because i think that sounds like a really approachable delicious drink for people yeah it's approachable with just a slight you know kind of dangerous edge it was invented by a, a bartender named Katie Stipe, 
at a bar called the Flatiron Lounge here in New York that doesn't exist anymore, but it was an important cocktail bar at the beginning of the cocktail revival. And not many people were making tequila cocktails back then, but she, what she did was basically make a tequila version of a Hemingway daiquiri. But instead of the maraschino liqueur that's usually in a Hemingway daiquiri, she put Campari. And instead of the, um, the rum, she put tequila. So it's just um, a, a wonderful, refreshing uh, sour. There's also lime juice and grapefruit juice in there. And uh, that has turned into a modern classic. That's great. And I love seeing um, uh, some Robert Simonson originals in here, um, more, <laughs> yeah. more so than usual um, creations on offer. Can you tell us about a couple of those or, or how you develop sure. them? Um, those are, yeah, like you say, those are unicorns. I, I don't tend to put my own drinks in the books, um, but this time I got a little more creative and I, I had more than usual. Um, there's one. So the book is separated into three categories, uh, tequila cocktails, mezcal cocktails, and cocktails that have both tequila and mezcal. So one of them that I invented, it's called the Cameron cocktail. It has uh, tequila, mezcal, uh, lemon juice, and orgeat, which is an almond flavored syrup, usually found in a Mai Tai. Um, this is a spin on a, a cocktail that already existed from the 20s called Cameron's Kick. But in the original, it was, um, it was Irish whiskey and scotch. So I just thought maybe this works with mezcal and tequila because they're closely associated, just mm -hmm. like those two whiskeys. So um, that's one, that's one. And uh, for people who like um, dessert drinks, there must be out, some out there. <laughs> uh, there is, where, where is it? A version of um, the Brandy Alexander, which I call oh. very cleverly, the Mezcal Alexander. <laughs> Um, so it's just this, it just, it just goes to show how versatile the spirits are because this, yeah. is, this is a brandy Alexander with the only difference being there's no brandy in there. There's two ounces of mezcal and it tastes delicious. Oh, fantastic. And I know like the, the margarita is, uh, iconic with, is a tequila drink. And I know the mez the mezcal margarita is so popular now, as you mentioned, and I know we had one the other night. Yeah, when, when people, people ask for a spicy margarita, that's how they order one. Yeah. They don't, sometimes they don't know that they want mezcal, but that's what they want. I've heard it called mezcal Rita too, and then it's just kind of, uh, you know, ordering it that way. But, but I kind of, I never, I don't really order that out much, but at certain occasions, like, like Leyendo, which is in our neighborhood, near our neighborhood, um, uh, Ivy Mix's bar, Julie Reiner's bar. Ivy Mix has two, um, two drinks in the book. Oh, great. And uh, so so they like they had a frozen margarita. So having that during the pandemic, having a frozen margarita in a coffee cup and being able to walk around a paper coffee cup was nice. And there's yeah. a, I always think there's a time and place for, you know, pardon my life, like a shitty margarita, you know, like if you're at the Yes, at the airport or something. But, um, but, but yeah, and I'm just curious, like with your regular margarita style, do you like it on the rocks with salted rim or what are your yes. on that? Cause if you um, use a martini, you can personalize it a little bit. It's funny uh, before this whole, the, the, the um, ascent of tequila and mezcal, if you asked me how I wanted a margarita, I would want it uh, served up, you know, like in a coupe yeah. or whatever with the salt on the rim. But uh, that bar I mentioned, Maya Well, that was opened by Phil Ward here in New York. When you ordered a margarita there, it was mezcal and was served on the rocks. And mm -hmm. now I drink them on the rocks and I kind of like them better that way. Yeah. Well, there was the actual margarita glass too, right? That kind of curvy. Yeah. The, one. It was very I big. Like bird bath. Yeah. But yeah. If, uh, chances are, I mean, back in the, the bad old days, if you ordered a margarita in like a restaurant, it was usually a frozen margarita and they probably used the mixto tequila and uh, mm -hmm. they probably used sour mix instead of real juice. So, I mean, it was a genuinely crappy margarita. Yeah. <laughs> probably get you come a long way. Yeah. Well, well, the timing on this worked out perfectly. I have one last question for you. Yeah. Um, and then we'll open it up to our, our friends joining in with any of their questions. And this one is breaking away bigger picture from Mezcal and tequila. You know, we're there's a sense of optimism now in a lot of places as we're taking a, a turn toward vaccine mm -hmm. and getting out more and 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 um, 
and we may do, I mean, like, like, uh, you know, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm babbling now, but there is a favorite bar of ours in New York called Long Island Bar, just up the block from me. And mm -hmm. that closed March 13th and it was dark. Uh, and then one day I was supposed to meet Robert for dinner at another place outside in a patio. And I saw their neon sign was on. And I texted the owner, Toby Chikini. I was like, are you open dude? He's like, yeah, Simonson's here. And you were like the first person <laughs> to wander in there. So that was well, me and my wife, Mary Kate, we went there yeah. and we basically stood on the sidewalk until they like brought a table out but, for us. Exactly. And now it's like, you know, it's, it's been a respite, uh, an oasis for us in this safe outdoor seating. And it was mm -hmm. the same, but different. We saw the same bartenders we would run into to um, publicists we know or other bartenders or writers. And so there was a sense of we'll make this happen, but there's a sense that things are getting better. But for yeah. me personally, until I can sit at a bar again, like and, and order a drink and eat and be alone or together with someone um, without a plexiglass hockey, you know, penalty box thing. I think we're a little ways from away from that um, for us in New York. But for you, I'm curious, like, you know, we, 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 so I'm saying we've been lucky to experience some of the things we used to, but yeah. do you have a couple of priority spots anywhere in America or beyond that you can't wait to get to when the time is right when it's more of a sense of normalcy if ever that but like whether it's a certain restaurant or what you're drinking or a certain bar i was just curious if you had a couple on your hit list to share um, with us sure i mean well uh what well, during the pandemic uh my wife and i we tried to support all the bars that were open yeah. that way we got a lot of to-go cocktails and we, we 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 um drank ice cold martinis on the sidewalk um a lot of the ones uh so i've managed to like patronize some of the bars i love here in new york during this time so i guess the ones on my hit list would be elsewhere when it's safe to travel again yeah, um yeah. my favorite bar in milwaukee is an old cocktail lounge called bryant's cocktail lounge i'd love to go mm -hmm. there um i'd love to go to los angeles and have a martini at musso and frank you know uh, uh, take, can i only if i can go with you yeah there you go i love um, musso uh, a lot of places i'd love to be go uh you know countless bars in new orleans seattle uh san francisco um it'd be nice to nice to see these places again mary kate said we all have to go to the settle down tavern in uh oh right in yes Madison. yes our friend our friend brian bartles who who's a wisconsinite who was in new york for i think 19 years or so and ran a lot of successful bar programs and went back and opened this bar in the middle of a pandemic and so we can't wait to support him i am um, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I just want to personally thank everyone that showed up tonight. The show's not over. We're going to talk to you for a bit. So, Laura, if you want to, if you want to uh, come back from the ether and, uh, and yeah. see where she is, I want I want to I want to hear how if people liked the cocktails that they made, and I want to hear how many Kenny has actually drunk at this point, in Chicago. <laughs> yes, we have a friend our, our in Chicago who works for the Tribune, and and. Um, and uh, another friend, uh, his uh, his girlfriend, who works for Chicago Magazine, and they actually batched five of the cocktails from the book before this began. I don't know if their plan was to drink them all within an hour <laughs> or just, you know, one or two. <laughs> all right. That's, that's impressive people... because it came out Tuesday. Yeah. Hi, Hello. I saw a couple people post um, what they were making um, on Instagram too. So, oh, nice. I'll have to yeah, look at yeah. So I'm sure you guys were tagged if you want to look at it afterwards. Okay. All right. So um, are we wanting to get to some of the questions in the Q&A or you want? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So total novice question. I feel like mezcal and gin vary so greatly and I've had bartenders tell me this one works with this cocktail, et cetera. If you had to choose two to three mezcals to keep at home, what would you choose? That's from Ben. Uh, I would, well, the one, number one I would choose is called Luna. It's Del Maguey and the, is the name of the company. And the brand is Luna. Um, it's made of Espadine Agave. This uh, was actually one of the first mezcals created for the United States market expressly for being mixed in cocktails as opposed to being uh, sipped alone. So, and it's also one of the most affordable. So, I mean, I, I have a bottle over there, but I'm not gonna leave the camera. Um, this is another one that I actually used in the polar bear, uh, which is also, I'm, I'm just gonna recommend ones that are for cocktails as opposed to sipping because that's what the book's about. There's this one, 
Mezcal Union, and there's uh, Mezcal uh, Illegal, which is spelled like illegal, but with only one L. And that's also um, good for mixing. Obviously, if you're just interested in just sipping Mezcal or tequila, um, you, you want to go for different ones, you know, that, uh, I don't know, have more specific and challenging characters. All right. So another question in sort of the Mezcal category. Um, what are some of the types of Mezcal that have more of a saline quality and how would you use those in a cocktail? Hmm. Mm. I, I talk about in the book, there are three main things that determine what the Mezcal is going to taste like. One is uh, where it's grown like um, what kind of state in Mexico, highlands, lowlands, by the sea, not by the sea, that kind of thing. Uh, two is the uh, species of agave that they chose to distill. Most, most mezcals are distilled from espadine, the, the species called espadine, and that's because that species grows very quickly and therefore you can get your product out quickly. And the third thing is the, uh, the mezcalaro, the distiller, um, because these people have their own way of doing things and it's different at every place. So um, people have asked me questions like, uh, you know, of how would you, what does, what does mezcal made from this particular agave taste like? And I don't really know how to answer it because if that species of agave is made in a different place in Mexico by a different person, it ends up tasting different. There, 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 the similarity, there are more differences than similarities. Um, as to the specific question and ones that are salty or saline, I don't have an answer at the tip of my tongue because I am primarily a cocktail guy. I'm all about mixing it and how it tastes, the complete drink, the, the ensemble in the glass, as opposed to, I mean, the book, just so people understand the book, the book is not um, an assessment of tequilas and, and mezcals with tasting notes. It's not like that. I make a few recommendations, but pretty much I leave the recommendations of specific mezcals to the bartenders who have created the cocktails. So along those lines, Erica would like to know how you went about gathering the recipes for the book and get the right balance. Had you tried most of them in person um, and did the bartenders come up with new original cocktails just for the book? Uh, okay, um, so I had tasted most of them in person already. Uh, when I started the book, I knew half of the recipes I wanted to put in there because I had already had them and I thought they were wonderful and beautiful and excellent. Then after that, to find others, I reached out to bartenders. Ah, my dinner's ready. Um, <laughs> I reached out to bartenders uh, that I knew were talented with agave spirits and said, do you have any recipes that you're particularly proud of that aren't too complicated? And so I got more that way. I created a few myself. Um, no, no bartenders made drinks specifically for the book. All these drinks already existed. Okay. Somebody mentioned Betsy Stromberg, um, who helped design the book. Naked and Famous is our favorite. That is a very good drink. It's by Joaquin Simo. And um, it's sort of like a tequila version of a paper plane, if you know what that is. So. Hey, Betsy. Hey, Another Betsy. Guest. Oh. Another guest would like to know if it's a good book for a beginning beginner. Um, and generally, you know, do you have yes. to have like loads of ingredients or can you find something nice to make with just a few? Yes, no, I'm, I want this to be for beginners, for people who are discovering agave spirits or have already discovered it and know they love it, but they just want to know what to do with it. So, and I, I strove, um, to make all the recipes simple. There are very few infusions, very few special syrups. Most of the cocktails only call from three to five ingredients and you can get them at your local store. And I, I, I don't wanna guarantee, but it's a pretty sure bet that if you have a decent uh, liquor cabinet at home and you buy the book, they're gonna be like four or five you can make right away. I mean, Mezcal Margarita, Mezcal Negroni, um, there's a Mezcal Stinger in there, a lot of these, there are actually a few that have only two ingredients in them. So I have a couple from Kenny here. First of all, Kenny says we are on the last mechanical art. <laughs> all right. <laughs> what does he think? 
<laughs> yeah, what do you think? Okay, he'll tell us. <laughs> Jenny, drop it in the chat. Yeah, let us know what you think. Um, and then also says, mezcal and tequila are often successfully mixed. Mm -hmm. IVC and Mia mixes mezcal and rum. The polar bear you made mixes mezcal and creme de menthe. Any other surprising split spirit combos that you really enjoy? You mean aside from agave spirits or does he mean agave and some other? Agave spirits? with okay. something else. Yeah, something well, that surprised you. I mentioned that uh, tequila, I mean that tiki cocktail called Sean and Juan, which actually pairs uh, mezcal with uh, Irish whiskey. So that's kind of cool. Um, let's see. Mezcal goes and tequila go extremely well with sherry. So if you like sherry, I mean, that is a wonderful option. Um, I talk about, I mean, uh, jalapeno, I mean, is in a lot of these drinks. Uh, people found out, bartenders found out very quickly that if you just infuse your tequila with a uh, jalapeno pepper for like 15 minutes, it can really transform a lot of different drinks. Um, there are a few that, you know, you don't see. Um, I didn't see many uh, drinks that put agave spirits with gin. That didn't seem to work. Um, but uh, for most case, uh, it, it mixed with almost everything. Yeah, Robert, if I can give a shout out for agave, agave and chinar, because you mm -hmm. have the the agave and the artichoke and kind of coming right. together plays really nicely, especially as there's a 50-50 shot or sipper, but in, in like the, the last mechanical art too. Yeah, there's another drink in the book that has a uh, chinar. It's by Phil Ward. It's called Augie March. Um, and it has um, tequila, sweet vermouth, and chinar. It's, it's kind of like a, uh, an agave spin on a little Italy. Which yeah, that was on my list. That's on my list to make for sure. Yeah, yeah, that goes really well. Vincent would like to know, were any of the cocktails in the book, let's see, do any of the cocktails in the book have Fernet from south of our border? Oh, gosh, I should know this off the top of my yeah. head. I, I, I think there is. Yeah, is the there? real deal. The real deal. Oh, the real deal. Let me look. I, I don't um, know if we use Fernet. He may be speaking of Fernet Valle, or Valle, which is uh, Mexican. Deal, deal. It does have Fernet. This is a drink by Erin Reese. Um, and she created it actually at Maya Well. In 2005, it's got Mezcal, Punta Mes, uh, Vermouth, uh, Carpano Antica, another Vermouth, and Fernet Branca. But it's only got a teaspoon of Fernet Branca, but you know, you often could, it's enough. You could use this Mexican Fernet too to keep it uh yeah. Fernet Vallette is uh it's a Frenchman who created this in in uh in Mexico but um it's a uh, it's a fun one to try but yeah yeah a lot of the Fernet drinks the famously like the Toronto and the Hanky Panky are that famous teaspoon of Fernet because it's just so strong and overpowering that's real but um but yeah that's the one that came, I didn't mean to steal your thunder but that's the one that jumped out at me to try for sure so there's at least one <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, leave it to Brad to have zeroed in on that one. Yeah, he, he finds the Amaro drinks right away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, and so, Billy, uh, if you are up for it, would love just one sipping recommendation, Mezcal, if you have it. Okay. Um, where's, okay. Uh, so there is a, um, a brand called La Luna and they make some fine mess calls. And they, they tend to do this. One thing that's happened during this whole agave revolution is you know how there are like um, single origin coffees and things like that. So they've started put out mezcals that are only one type of agave. Now this historically wasn't really how they did things in Mexico. Um, they used the agaves that were ripening at the time. And so the mezcal they produced could contain any number of species of agave. But um, I guess it's more of a marketing term. Adele McGuay kind of came up with this single village mezcal idea. And so you get these mezcals that are just one type of agave. So La Luna does this. And there is uh, an agave species that for whatever reason I really like called Cupriata, uh, starts with a C, Cupriata. And it always seems to come out with all these tropical notes. 
you know, like mango and pineapple and things like that. Very unexpected and surprising things. So I, I am only making this recommendation because I actually tasted a bunch of mezcals yesterday um, for another reason. And that La Luna Cupriata really spoke to me. It was just so delicious that I would just sip that by itself. All right. All right. I think that's where actually that was perfect because we're at about six o'clock. So well done, everyone. Yeah. And you were asking at the beginning, who, where, where is Barnegat Light? That's actually where my wife is right now. She's in Barnegat Light, New Jersey on the Jersey Shore. So. Oh, that was an uh -oh. actual place. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> West Coast, Midwestern raised me had not heard of that before. So there you go. Yeah. She just All right. That. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you, Robert. And congratulations on the new book. And if, uh, if any of the people here are in Seattle, just want to let you know that there are signed copies at the book larder. Absolutely, yes. We have signed copies. Shout out Seattle. We yeah. will also <laughs> be posting this to our YouTube channel. It'll be up by Tuesday. Um, so you can watch it again. You can share it with other people. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Have a lovely weekend. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> I'm going to make another bowl of bear after this is done. That was good. That's what was that dinner, Bill? What do you have for dinner, Robert? Um, well, I, 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 I <laughs> do you really want to know? Um, I was actually I going to make this pasta with um, a pork belly, but then I misread the recipe and I actually have to cook it for six hours and then put it in the fridge <laughs> overnight. So I don't know what I'm having for dinner. <laughs> I'm just get some butter. <laughs> well, all right. I can eat for a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you for, and Brad, thank you for moderating. Laura, thanks for hosting. Of course. Yeah, everyone had a, have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.